Hey, Father, we come before you. And Lord, we thank you for another day we can gather together to worship you and to hear from you. And Father, just keep our hearts open. Keep us sensitive to what your spirit is showing us. And Lord, help us to live out our faith. We love you so much. And as we worship you this morning, Lord, may these songs bring honor and glory to you. And Lord, may they draw us close to you. We thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. We are reading this morning from uh, Psalm 19, and I'm reading to you from the New King James Version. Psalm 19, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is a great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. This morning, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 5 as we continue our in-depth study of Paul's first letter to Timothy. And in our last study, we focused on respect for the family. And, you know, it, Paul wasn't speaking of our biological family here, but really the family of God, our new birth family. And it, that's not to say that we're not to respect our biological family, but that wasn't the focus that Paul was uh, dealing with in those verses. And specifically, how do we deal with sin among the brethren is kind of the focus of those verses. Not ignoring it, but to deal with it, and deal with it with the idea of restoration, not destruction. You know, uh, you, you see a lot of this with the news, you know, uh, and a lot of uh, people out there that want to destroy people. They don't want to help them. It's real easy to put people down, isn't it? I mean, it, it, I just know from me, my personal experience. When someone says something to me, man, I could be sarcastic as fast as anything. But not to say something, because with the idea of restoration, not their destruction. And, you know, as we continue on here, Paul's going to deal with now respect for elders. And not talking about how old a person is, but the office of an elder in the church. We dealt with the older man and that um, earlier on in chapter 5 of 1 Timothy. And this is the elder in the church, respect for them. And you know, I realize some of you may feel that, you know, I'm not an elder, what's the point with all this? Um, but I think Ray Stedman kind of sums it up for us. He said in this section from 1 Timothy 5, the Apostle Paul again turns to admonitions and instructions concerning the elders of a church. Many of you will never be elders, so you're already thinking, this is not for me, it's boring stuff. 
But remember that in these passages, the apostle is dealing with the divinely given machinery of the proper functioning of a church. As we've already seen in chapter 3 of this letter, a church that is functioning as, it, as its Lord intends is a uniquely powerful body. Paul calls such a church the dwelling place of God and the pillar and bulwark of the truth. This is where you find God in any age. It's where God lives. A church is also the display base for the defense of the truth in a confused and bewildered world. It's where the mistaken and elusive ideas of men are corrected. I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about people. It's people who are led by elders. So to give our attention to elders is an important matter. To get a church operating as it ought to is more important than maintaining good schools or electing strong officials to office or building a sound economic base in this country. It's far more important than developing our natural resources or controlling crime. All of those things are very important. Millions of dollars and many, many hours are devoted to them. Yet with all my heart, I say that they are less important than getting a church functioning the way it ought to. History confirms that if a church functions the way it ought, all of the things above will begin to occur. This nation is testimony to that fact among the nations of the world. Because a nucleus of godly men and women sought to walk righteously before God, all the things that we say make up the genuine American way of life, as far as that has been in existence, have followed. Absolutely. You know, we want to help uh, uh, our communities. We want to help our families. We want to help our nation. It's sharing the gospel message, bringing them to Jesus, because that's the only thing that's going to change them. You can pass all the laws you want. You realize there's laws that say that we're not to murder, mm -hmm. and yet Peter will still do. Why? Because it's a hard issue, and that's what needs to change. And so this is an important subject, how to deal with elders in the church. Paul wrote it to the church at Ephesus, and not just Timothy. And there seems over the years now that the role of elders or pastors seems to be dwindling, the respect for them. Um, some of it is because of the way pastors behave. But how do we deal with this? You know, Duke University spoke on the decline of respect for church leaders. They said Americans have significantly less confidence in their religious leaders than they did a generation ago. And more than two-thirds would prefer they not dabble in politics, according to a new book by a Duke University professor. This loss of confidence patterns similar declines in respect for leaders in government, education, banking, and other walks of life. It may help illustrate why fewer Americans are themselves interested in joining the clergy. clergy. Uh, research found that between 1973 and 2008, the percentage of people with great confidence in religious leaders declined from 35% to less than 25%. Wow. They've lost confidence in church leaders. What's happened? That was way back in 2011 that article was written. But this, listen to what happened in 2022. How ministry has affected pastors' lives and why so many are dropping out of the ministry. The overall health of pastors in the U.S. has declined markedly since 2015, with increasing numbers who say that they face declining respect from their community and a lack of true friends, according to a recent study. Data collected by faith-based organization Barna Group as part of its resist, resilient pastor research showed a significant decrease in pastors' spiritual, mental, and emotional well-being, as well as their overall quality of life between 2015 and 2022. Pastors also noted that recent years have taken a toll on their physical health, with 22% describing their physical well-being as being poor or below average in 2022, compared to only 7% in 2015. While 24% said their physical health was excellent eight years ago, only 9% said the same last year. Pastors who describe themselves as emotionally or mentally exhausted jumped from 21% in 2015 to 32% in 2022, 
and those who described the respect they received from members of their community as excellent dropped from 22% down to 10%. That's crazy. There's a 42% of ministers wonder if they should abandon their vocation altogether amid unsustainable stress and loneliness. Almost half of pastors today are so stressed out that they are thinking about dropping out. What happened? I think, you know, people expect pastors to do everything, and they can't anymore. And, you know, searching for a pastor, what do people even expect of them? Well, I'll give you a, a list. I failed at the first one, so just so you know, you don't have to tell me. He preaches exactly 20 minutes and then he sits down. <laughs> what are you laughing at? All right. <laughs> I think I could fulfill this one because I'm getting older and maybe after 20 minutes I may have to sit down, but you know, that's not the end. He condemns sin but never steps on anybody's toes. I don't know how you do that. He works from 8 in the morning to 10 at night, doing everything from preaching sermons to sweeping. He's 36 years old. He's been preaching for 40 years. <laughs> he's tall on the short side, heavy set in a thin sort of way, and handsome. <laughs> He has eyes of blue or brown to fit the occasion <laughs> and wears his hair parted in the middle, left side, dark and straight, right side, brown and wavy. Oh my gosh, you know? He has a burning desire to work with the youth and spends all his time with the senior citizens. He smiles all the time while keeping a straight face because he has a keen sense of humor that finds him seriously dedicated. He makes... 15 calls a day to church members, spends all his time evangelizing non-members, and is always found in his study if he's needed. Unfortunately, he burned himself out and died at the age of 32. Yeah, that's probably the reality. It's funny, and yet we see this happening today. And it's taken its toll on pastors. Now, here in 1 Timothy 5, there are some guidelines on how leaders should be treated, uh, how to pick them, and so on. I've broken it down into uh, these points, and they're in your bulletin. Faithful service in 1 Timothy 5, verses 17 through 18. Leadership correction, 1 Timothy 5, 19 through 21. Raising up leaders, 1 Timothy 5, 22. Physical problems, 1 Timothy 5, 23. And be observant, 1 Timothy 5, verses 24 through 25. So, Let's begin reading this morning, 1 Timothy chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, as we look at this topic, respect for leaders. This is what Paul wrote Timothy. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Again, this is faithful service. That's the focus, I think, of these verses. And Paul speaks of elders. And that means the pastor or shepherds and elders who were in charge with the spiritual aspects of the church. Remember, deacons dealt with the physical aspects of the church. And the idea here, how do you transition from dealing with widows in the previous verses and now with elders? But the whole idea is, how do you care for these people? Just like, you, how do you care for widows? And I know some feel that some of these elders were not teachers by what's written in these verses. First of all, all pastors need to be teachers. That's the bottom line. I mean, how do you be a pastor without being a teacher? That makes absolutely no sense to me. Uh, we're to bring the word of God to people. But I think what Paul is saying here is that some elders were teachers, um, and that wasn't their focus, though. Notice it says, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. That's a focus of some of these, teach, these elders and these pastors. Their whole focus was the word of God, was with doctrine. 
The others, not so much, but they filled in from time to time. Like Steve or Mike, who came up from Oshkosh to teach. They fill in from time to time in the ministry, in teaching the Word of God. But I believe elders are to be teachers. I would not have an elder who's not a teacher. Uh, what if they're over the Sunday school? Well, then they're more deacons. They're dealing with the um, different aspect of the church or cleaning the church or whatever. And here, how are they compensated for their labor? Well, Paul says they're worthy of double honor. What's that mean? Well, I think he's speaking of their pay for their service to the Lord as the church is able. Now, I know some people feel the church shouldn't pay a pastor, but I don't agree with that. I don't think that's what the scriptures teach. You know, Paul said, for the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. In other words, it's cruel for a farmer to bind the mouth of a uh, a, a uh, an ox while he's treading the grain, preventing him from eating even though he's working. He's threshing the grain. And so to, to refuse to support those who provide spiritual food is just as unjust and heartless as it would be to muzzle an animal. Now, do we see this in the scriptures? Yeah, the Old Testament. People supported the priests who were serving in the tabernacle and later on in the temple. Um, has this gone wrong in some aspects? Absolutely. I mean, you look at some of these guys and you look at, you know, they're getting millions of dollars. They have planes. They have mansions, multiple mansions. Yeah, that's wrong. And no, I'm not jealous of what they make. I, what I need is just enough to pay my bills. And God has provided. The church has blessed our family over the years. And I'm blessed to be, it's been like 15 years since I had to work another job and just serve here at the church. That gives me the time to do what I need to do. You know, when I was working before, I couldn't do a lot of these other things. Um, but now God has given me the ability to do it. And can we be content in what we make? Well, we need to be. How much do you need to make? You know, it's kind of like Rockefeller said, how much money do you need to make? Well, just a little bit more. And that will never end. Always a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Paul said in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry nothing out. That's a guarantee. There is no one that's going to carry their wealth out of this world. I personally have never seen a U-Haul follow a hearse. Because he can't take it with you. Paul said, having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You look at the health, wealth, and prosperity teachers. And what do they do? Oh, you know, sow your seed faith gift to me. If you give 100, you're going to get, you know, 500 back. Well, you know what? Give me a hundred, and you'll get five hundred back, right? That's what I like to tell them. But they make a profit off of people, and people give so much to these people. I've seen some shows where they have money strewn all over the floor, and they're just kind of rolling in it. I'm thinking, wow, how is this honoring to God? Can we be content with what we have? Can't, because if we can't, we're not going to be able to stay focused on the work that God has called you to do. If you love money more than God, you're going to be in trouble. Paul says you need to be content. Now, here in verse 18, I want to bring up this point because there's many who like to negate the scriptures or say, you know, 
these words were written at much later dates, but Paul in verse 18 quotes out of Luke 10, 7. He says, for the scripture says. What is he saying? He's saying that Luke is part of the scriptures. In 2 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16, Peter tells us that Paul's letters are part of the scriptures, God's word. And in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. 24, uh, Paul quotes once again from Luke 23, 19, saying it's from the scriptures. What's my point? My point is that these letters were written, and they were not only written and read in the church, but they were passed on to other churches, so they were familiar with them. So this is the word of God. We can trust it. And those who are faithful in service are to be taken care of. And that's the key, faithful service, that they're teaching the Word of God. And if they're not faithful, they shouldn't be in ministry, let alone paid. Now, what if leaders need to be corrected? Well, that's what we're going to look at next, leadership correction. Look at verse 19 here in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, do, doing nothing without partiality. You know, make no mistake about it. Leadership, those in leadership are targets for Satan's attack. And it's kind of like they have a bullseye painted on their chest. The idea is if you strike the shepherd, the sheep are going to be scattered and the shepherd of the church. And Satan is very good at using that tactic or method. He uses gossip, idle words to bring down leaders, especially pastors. I'll give you an example. It's about a pastor who was trying to defend himself against criticism. Some heavy charges against him. And he said, there's a story going about that I told my wife not to go to a certain church that has wild meetings. They say my wife went anyway, and I dragged her out of the church by her hair, and I hurt her so badly she had to go to the hospital. I mean, these are serious charges. Don't laugh, man. This is serious. Let me respond to these accusations. First of all, I never told her to stay away from that church. Second, I didn't drag her out by her hurt, hair. Third, she never had to go to the hospital. Lastly, I've never been married, so I don't have a wife. <laughs> and that's Paul's point here. Before you believe anything about a leader, check out the story you were told with more than one witness. Don't believe everything you hear. But if the accusations are substantiated, then it needs to be acted upon. And I'm not talking about trivial things like likes and dislikes and people's opinions. I'm talking about sin, false teaching, heresy. And that's what Paul's talking about. You know, Barclay said, nothing does more harm than when someone, when some people are treated as if they can do no wrong and others as if they can do no right. Absolutely. You know, Clark goes, says, put it like this. He said, the reason of this difference is evident. Those whose business is to correct others will usually have many enemies. Great caution, therefore, should be used in admitting accusations against such persons. That's true. But again, just because you're in leadership or an elder doesn't shield a person from accountability. In fact, they're more accountable. But Paul puts in this protection that there has to be more than one witness to protect them, which is important. You know, what about here at Calvary? What if I, you know, got into some sin or started teaching heresy? What do you do? What can you do? Well, Steve can confront me on it, being the elder, but he couldn't remove me from the position. What he would then do if I refused to do anything or if it was a sin that I did need to be removed by, he would go to another Calvary pastor and speak to him, and he would come and talk with me. And if I refused to deal with the sin, or if the sin was bad enough to have me removed from my position, he has the authority to remove me. 
It's not that the church can remove me or an elder could remove me, but another pastor, senior pastor can do that. It protects me and it protects you. Uh, you know, John Calvin in his commentary on 1 Timothy said, uh, explained what the reasons are why people are so quick to receive an accusation against the pastor. He said, the more sincerely any pastor strives to further Christ's kingdom, the more he is loaded with spite, the more fierce do the attacks upon him become. And not only so, but as soon as any charge is made against ministers of the word, it is believed as surely and firmly as if it had been already proved. This happens not only because a higher standard of integrity is required for them, but because Satan makes most people, in fact nearly everyone, over-credulous so that without investigation, they eagerly condemn their pastors whose good name they ought to be defending. Absolutely. You know, being in Russia and talking with the, these pastors, a lot of them are going through struggles within the church, uh, people fighting amongst themselves, uh, lots of attacks. And I said, you know, I understand what you're going through. But if you were doing nothing for the Lord, Satan would leave you alone because <laughs> he could care less if you're not doing anything. But you are a faithful minister of Jesus Christ. You are sharing the gospel message. You are teaching the word. And that's why you are being attacked so much. And it's true. We have to be careful. And... You know, if a pastor or elder is guilty of immoral behavior or illegal activity, he needs to be rebuked and rebuked publicly, which seems harsh. But leaders are held to a higher standard. Remember when Paul confronted Peter? You know, Peter refused to eat with the Gentiles, and he, he ate with the Jews, Jewish believers. In fact, he got Barnabas to join him. So he's getting others to be involved in his bad behavior. And Paul rebukes him publicly. Why? Because his actions affected so many people that it needed to be done in public to say, Peter, you're wrong here. And everyone needs to hear that because you've got people behaving like you are. Yeah, it's not easy. And hopefully, you know, as others see it, if they want to get involved in the ministry, they'll go, hey, man, you know, I need to take this pretty seriously. If I go astray, this could happen to me. Yeah, it is a serious position. And again, though, as we deal with sin within the leadership, it's always with the idea, again, of restoration. We want to see the person restored, not destroyed. You know, Paul in Galatians 6, verses 1 through 3, put it like this. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. The idea here of restoration is like setting a broken bone. And you have to get close to the person to set that bone. And then when that bone heals, that bone is even stronger than it was before. And that's the idea. Deal with the person because you love them and you want to see them restored. You want to see their faith stronger than before. But again, if a leader is involved in a sin... Uh, there are certain things that removes them from their position. That's just the way it is. And when you deal with this, you don't show favoritism. You just deal with it the way God has said. And there's a great responsibility, you know, without prejudice, without partiality. And James hit on that. He said, My brethren, in James chapter 2, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Not at all. It doesn't matter if someone's rich or poor, young or old. It doesn't matter what, who they are. 
you treat them the same. And I, I again, I think it's important that as a, a body of believers, that's what we do. In fact, Paul in Galatians chapter 3 said, there's neither Jew or Greek, neither slave or free, there's neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And Jesus is not a respecter of persons. He treats us all fairly according to our role in the church and life, and we need to do the same. And again, as leaders, we're not going to be perfect. Not at all. I'm far from that. Don't talk to my wife after church today. She can, but she would tell you. But, you know, we do the best that we can as God gives us the ability. And, you know, it's, it's dealing with that flesh that we all battle with. You know, it waged, the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and it's a daily battle that we face. And if anyone doesn't think it is, they're a liar. Every day there's a battle that we face. So, yes, there needs to be correction for leaders. You're not to ignore that. And I, I've seen that in, even within Calvary chapels where, you know, they have been um, accused of sexual misconduct. And it's, these are huge churches, huge, thousands and thousands of people. And the, I, I cannot believe that the leadership was not aware of these issues. But it wasn't dealt with until he got caught and arrested. Too late. I don't care how popular they are. I don't care that they're drawing in thousands and thousands of people. You're, show, you're not showing your love for that pastor or that leader by ignoring his sin. It has to be dealt with. Leadership correction. Paul then moves on, and he's going to deal with raising up leaders. How do you do that? What's that all about? Well, he says, Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. You know, if you've been here at all for any time here at Calvary, you know that I don't put people in leadership positions, elder or pastor positions, too quickly. Why? Because... I watch people. I just watch how they serve. I, I really don't pick leaders or elders or pastors. God does. He raises them up, and all I do is acknowledge what God is showing me, how they serve. You know, if you have to have a title to serve, then forget about it, because once you get the title, you're not going to serve. <laughs> if you just go and serve without those titles, yeah. And uh, it's amazing. You know, do I make mistakes? Sure, because I can't know the heart of a person. I can only observe the person's actions. Um, but I do err on the side of not raising people up too soon because it's a lot harder to remove them from ministry. It gets messier, and so I don't raise them up too quickly. Uh, and I also look at what are the qualifications, you know, First Timothy 3, for elders, for pastors. Because if you're not living that life now, you're not going to live it when you have that position. That's not going to change. And many times it ends up getting worse. And you don't put them in because their uh, position in the community or their money or their whatever. It's because they love the Lord, they serve the Lord, and their life it's not perfect, but you see the characteristics that are mentioned in 1 Timothy chapter 3 for pastors and elders being fulfilled in their life. One person said, you know, a man said to me recently about an elder in another church. He's a good man, and he's almost honest. <laughs> that doesn't qualify him as an elder. Shouldn't you be an honest person? He's really close. Well, you know, here's a drink of water. It's almost pure. It's just, there's a little bit of poison in it, but don't worry about it. It's almost good for you. A pure life. Be an example, you know. Um, 
you know, my prayer is always that when people look at me and look at my life, then I mean, obviously they don't see me as perfect, but that I'm an example to you of living out my faith in Christ, that I've encouraged you in your walk. I think that's so important. Um, you know, like I said, going to Russia and trying to encourage these uh, pastors that are there, it, it blessed my heart, and they encouraged me. It, it's amazing how God works. You go to help, and God does amazing work in your own life. Now, Paul also says here that, nor share in other people's sins. And you think, well, what is that speaking of? Well, there's two ways to look at that. He could have been warning Timothy not to let himself get drawn into the sins of others who are trying to accuse another in the church with heresy or whatever. Don't get involved with that. Um, but I think with the context here, and I'm always trying to look at context, 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 it would seem that Paul is warning Timothy of the dangers of ordaining a pastor or elder too soon. And before long, you know, they're in this immoral lifestyle. And Timothy, you're responsible. You're accountable for placing these people in this position. Um, so you need to be careful. That's where I tend to lean more what Paul is speaking of because it seems to fit the context of uh, what he's been saying in the previous verses. And, you know, think about it. As Christians, we are to be honest, pure, loving, in leadership, absolutely. You know? It is a privilege to be a pa the pastor and to minister to you guys. You know, again, I, I loved going to Russia, but this is where God has me, here. And I, I, I love you guys dearly, and I do anything to help you to grow in your relationship with God. That is my heart's desire. Um, but many times, people in leadership can drive people away from the Lord. You know, I'm sure all of you know of Mark Twain. You know, it's interesting because as you look at his life, it seems like ch the church leaders were largely to blame for his becoming hostile to the Bible and the Christian faith. You think, well, how did it happen? Well, when he was growing up, he knew elders and deacons who owned slaves abused them, men using foul language, and saw them practice dishonesty during the week after speaking piously in church on Sunday. He, used, he listened to ministers use the Bible to justify slavery. And he did see genuine love for the Lord in some people, including his mother and his wife. But he was so disturbed by the bad teaching and poor example of church leaders that he was bitter towards the things of God. Wow, I, Lord, help me never to be a bad example to people. You know, again, a privilege to be an elder, a, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, whatever. But it comes with a big responsibility. And we, our desire is always to draw people to Jesus. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And that's always the key. The same with Joshua. The, the children of Israel said to Joshua, man, we're going to follow you as long as you follow the Lord. And that's the key. You just don't follow people if they're not following the Lord because where are they going to go? You follow people that are following the Lord. And so leadership is important because you're dealing with people and you're re representing God before them. So raising up leaders, Paul deals with that. As we look, read on, we're going to be looking at some physical problems Timothy had. Verse 23 says, No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities or illnesses. So, as you read this, it almost seems like, does this make any sense? You're talking about, Paul, about Timothy's illness here. Well, Timothy was probably abstaining from alcohol to be an example, and he suffered from some kind of gastrointestinal illness. I don't know. I, I know it as Montezuma's revenge. You know, don't drink the water down in Mexico or you're going to get sick. Uh, I think that was the whole idea. And so the fermentation process would eliminate some of these harmful bugs in the water and help Timothy out. So he says, you know, it's okay to drink a little wine. He doesn't tell him, you know, get drunk. But yeah, drink a little wine because it'll help your stomach problems. 
And it, it almost seems like Timothy was kind of a sickly person. Maybe it was due to just the GI problems that he had, but he had frequent infirmities, infirmities or illnesses. Now, I find it interesting because Paul didn't name and claim a healing for Timothy, did he? You know, not everyone is healed. And Paul never felt the Lord saying to heal Timothy. Healing is always based upon God's will. Why do some people get sick, some Christians that are dynamic men and women, and they die? While others are just horrible people and they live. Hey, I leave it in the hands of God. Maybe because the horrible person needs to come to saving faith. That's why he's still around. I don't know. But it wasn't a lack of faith or some sin in Timothy's life. You know, Paul prayed three times for that thorn in the flesh to be removed. We don't know what it is. It could have been just the, the severe eye problems he had. It was so bad that he couldn't even write. He had others write for him. But what did the Lord tell him? My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made purpose, perfect in weakness. Not all are healed. Now, there was a gentleman who wrote, when I was searching for hard evidence of God as an alternative to faith, one day I found it, on television of all places. While randomly flipping a dial, I came across a mass healing service being conducted by Catherine Coleman. I watched for a few minutes as she brought various people up on the stage and interviewed them. Each one told an amazing story of supernatural healing, cancer, heart conditions, paralysis. It was like a medical encyclopedia up there. As I watched Coleman's program, my doubts gradually melted away. At last, I had found something real and tangible. Coleman asked a musician to sing her favorite song. He touched me. That's what I needed, I thought. A touch, a personal touch from God. She held out that promise and I lunged for it. Three weeks later, when Catherine Coleman came to a neighboring state, I skipped classes and traveled half a day to attend one of her meetings. The atmosphere was unbelievably charged. Soft organ music in the background, the murmuring sound of people praying aloud, some in strange tongues, and every few minutes a happy interruption when someone would stand and claim, I'm healed. One person especially made an impression. A man from Milwaukee who had been carried into the meeting on a stretcher. When he walked, yes, walked on stage, we all cheered wildly. He told us he was a physician and he was even more impressed. And I was even more impressed. He had an incurable lung cancer. He said he was told he had six months to live. But now tonight he believed God had healed him. He was walking for the first time in months. He felt great, praise God. I wrote down the man's name and practically floated out of that meeting. I had never known such a certainty of faith before. Notice what his faith is based upon, okay? This is key. My search was over. I had seen proof of a living God in those people on the stage. If he could work tangible miracles in them, then surely he had something wonderful in store for me. I wanted contact with the man of faith I had seen at the meeting, so much so that exactly one week later, I, I phoned directory assistance in Milwaukee and got the physician's number. When I dialed it, a woman answered the phone. May I please speak to Dr. S., I said. Long silence, who are you, she said at last. I figured she was just screening calls from patients or something. I gave my name and told her I admired Dr. S and had wanted to talk to him ever since Catherine, Catherine Coleman meeting. I had been very moved by his story, I said. Another long silence. Then she spoke in a flat voice, pronouncing each word so slowly. My husband is dead. Just that one sentence, nothing more, and she hung up. I can't tell you how, devast how that devastated me. I was wasted. I half staggered into the next room where my sister was sitting. Richard, what's wrong, she asked. Are you all right? No, I was not all right, but I couldn't talk about it. I was crying. My mother and sister tried to pry some explanation out of me, but what could they, I tell them? For me, the certainty I had staked my life on had died with that phone call. A flame had flared, 
bright for one fine shining week and then gone dark like a dying star. Wow. His faith was all based on this person being healed. And yet the Bible tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Our faith has to be based upon God, not upon some circumstance. And healing is based on the will of God. And here's the thing. Hear me out. God's desire is that all are healed. Now, I know you guys are getting a little nervous. What's he talking about? All are healed. You know me. But it's true. Not name it, claim it, grab it, blab it, miracles for money theology. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. I'm talking about spiritual healing. For all who come to Jesus, that is the most important healing that can happen in our lives. Because with physical healing, yeah, you could be healed for a time, but what's going to happen? You're going to eventually die. And thank God one day these physical bodies will be changed. We'll get new bodies for our spirit and soul to dwell in that will never get sick, never fade away. And we'll be able to travel. It won't be 16 hours on a plane. It will be there, you know. It'll be great. And I can get out of, I don't know if we'll sleep, but if I have to get out of bed, I won't groan. <laughs> Praise God. And Paul in Romans 8, verses 18 through 23, put it like this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Yeah, our focus. Yeah, it, it's hard because in these bodies we have pain. We go through difficult times. But we have to look ahead to the glory, where we're going. For the earnest expectation of the certain of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we are even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Oh yeah, man, one day we're going to be received up into glory. And we will never get sick. These bodies won't break down, fall apart, die. And God's preparing this mansion for us, a permanent dwelling place for our spirit and soul to dwell in. This life is temporary. What God is offering us is eternal life that will never fade away. And is it easy? No, it's not always easy. And I realize some of you may feel, you know, Pastor Joe, you don't know what I'm going through. This illness has made me incapacitated. I can't do anything. I don't want to do anything. I want to just die. I'm not saying... It's easy. I'm not saying you're weak in the faith if you're struggling, because we all struggle. But let me share with you the, an encouraging story, because I think sometimes we need to be reminded that whatever happens in our lives, God is in control. It was way back in the summer of 1967. Joni Erickson and her sister rode their horses in the Chesapeake Bay, and they went for a swim but it didn't turn out well. Joni dived into shallow water, struck her head on a rock, and became a quadriplegic, paralyzed from the neck down. During two years of painful rehabilitation, she learned how to paint with her mouth and what this disability meant for her faith. Was she angry with God? At times? Sure, let's face it, we're human, right? How could this happen? God! What are you doing? And she wished at times that she didn't even survive. But since then, she learned 
that it is in her weakness that God's strength can shine through. She's blessed so many people all over the world and shares her faith, faith that sustains her. It wasn't because she was healed. It's because of who God is. And yet, yeah, first, it was, she found it impossible to reconcile her condition with her belief in a loving God. But she understood. She came to that realization. And the catalyst was a good friend who said to her, and I always find it interesting how important friends are, godly friends. Joni, Jesus knows how you feel. He was paralyzed. He couldn't move or change position on the cross. He was paralyzed by the nails. And she said the realization was profoundly comforting. God became incredibly close to me, and eventually I understood that he loves me. I had no other identity but God, and gradually it became enough. I prayed for healing and truly believed it would come. The Bible speaks of our bodies being glorified. Now I realize I will be healed. I'm just going through a 40 or 50 year delay and God stays with me even through that. Yeah. Yeah, these bodies are going to be healed because they're going to be new. That's what Paul said. We groan in these bodies, but we wait for the redemption of them. But until that day, don't let your illness, your pain, your suffering drive you. Let the Lord lead you because he's the great shepherd. So Timothy, drink a little wine. Again, it was fermented to get rid of the bacteria to help his stomach condition. Timothy had some physical problems. So as we finish up here this morning, we're going to look at be observant. Look at verses 24 and 25 of 1 Timothy chapter 5. Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some men follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. Again, keep in mind the context here, uh, the pointing of elders, church leadership, dealing with sin in the family of God. And Paul is telling Timothy, be observant. Pay attention. You know, there are people that are very good at covering their sins. So looking at what they're doing can be deceptive. Watch and pray before you raise up leaders in ministry. Um, on the other hand, good workers are clearly seen. They're not hidden. Or good works, I should say. And it's important to watch for people and how they're living out their faith. So take it slow. Wait for God, uh, for his discernment before you raise up leaders. Winston Churchill said, Men occasionally stumble, stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing happened. Yeah, that can be a common response to truth, but it places those who respond like that on the road to tragedy and destruction. You have to understand, you know, you, you fall, you stumble. Yeah, God will help you up, but you have to realize what you did. You have to pay attention. There's no way to love and follow God without loving and following the truth. And church leadership is so important. I think that is what Paul's point is in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. What is the reason God has placed these leaders in the church? We well, said for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effect of working, by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. That's what leadership is all about is helping people grow and use the gifts that God has given them to help them not be blown away by the winds of doctrine that blow through the church. And I've tried to do that over the years. Do people get mad at me? They do. But you know what? That's tough. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not going to let false teaching winds of doctrine blow through a church to destroy it. 
Let me close with this. You know, we've all seen geese fly together and they're impressive formations. You know, one side is longer than the other in their V formations. Do you know why it's like that? Because there's more geese on the other side. That's why. Sorry. But where are they going? Many times they're just going to a warmer climate. They're smarter than us. And they'll travel thousands of miles to get there. And why they fly in that pattern is fascinating. Those that are in the front will rotate their leadership. When one lead goose gets tired, it changes places with the one in the wing of the V formation and another will fly point. By flying as they do, the members of the flock create an upward air current for one another. Each flap of the wings literally creates an uplift for the bird immediately following. One author states that by flying in a V formation, the whole flock gets 71% greater flying range than if each goose flew on its own. 71%. That's incredible. Not only that, but when one goose gets sick or wounded, two fall out of the formation with it and follow it down to help and protect it. They stay with the struggler until it's able to fly again. The geese in the rear of the formation are the ones who do the honking. I suppose it's their way of announcing that they're following and that all is well. For sure, the repeated honks encourage those in front to stay at it. As I think about all this, one lesson stands out above all the others. It's the natural instinct of geese to work together. You know, it doesn't matter rotating, flapping, helping, or just honking. The flock is in it together, and they're able to accomplish what they sent it to do. The church is the body of Christ, and we are all working together. We're moving from an earthly home to a heavenly home. So leaders, pastors, elders, those who are working in the role of deacons or helping with the physical care of the church, all the various ministries, all the people in the church are working together, not separately. Why? For the betterment of the body of Christ here at Calvary Chapel of Manitowoc. And we need to remember that. One ministry is not more important than another. We work together. At times, do we have to honk? Yeah, at times we kind of need to honk and encourage each other, right? That's not a bad thing. We're just continuing moving forward. And again, pastors, elders in the church are important because they are helping to guide the church and lead the church, and thus the respect for elders. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your words this morning. Important to have a correct perspective of things. What leadership and elders are all about and how to deal with problems and all these things, Lord. You guide us. And what a blessing that is. We just pray, Lord, help us to learn and apply these things to our life. Help us to grow in our walk with you. And I pray for any who may be discouraged, those that are dealing with health issues or other issues, Lord, that seem overwhelming that they feel that they can't even do anything anymore. Lord, comfort them, give them your peace, and show them that you haven't given up on them, that you're still working in them and through them, and that all of us may be aware of that very point, Lord, that you never give up on us. Thank you for being our God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.